Hello, hi. Thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, my name is Margaret Streeter, and I am the manager for New America New York. Um, thanks also to the Core Club for hosting us again this week for an event. Um, we're so excited to have Lee here celebrating the launch of his new book, Breaking the, Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop, um, which has just been released this month. Um, Lee is a senior fellow at the Political Reform Program at New America, and he regularly writes for The Times, Vox, and other outlets like that. Joining Lee is Aisha Moody Mills, who is a nationally respected voice on politics. Before joining CNN as a political commentator, she was president and CEO of the LGBTQ Victory Fund and Institute. And she was recently a 2019 fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Institute of Politics. So please stick around after the conversation. Lee will be signing some of his books and please also support him and purchase a book tonight. That would mean quite a lot. Um, two final pieces of housekeeping. We are on the record this evening. We are recording the conversation and we'll turn it into a podcast later this week. And also, it is a very packed house, so if we have some latecomers, if you have any space um, on your row, if you can make room for them, that'd be great. Thank you again for coming, and please join me in welcoming Aisha and Lee. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Happy impeachment week. Or maybe it's uh, an interesting impeachment week on my end. Um, thank you all for being here. I actually am really honored to be invited to have this conversation with Lee, and congratulations to you again on this book. It is available for sale outside, so do pick up a copy if you don't already have one. Get it signed. Um, I know that so much goes into one's life to do the research and to kind of spend the years, three years you said it's been that it took you to put together this book, um, and we just don't have enough time to hear all the dirty details about it, but I do want to know um, what inspired you to write this book? Because for at least 20 something years, I've been in circles and conversations um, with some of my progressive friends talking about, could we imagine a multi-party system? Um, what would it take for us to have proportional representation? And so this is certainly a structural change conversation that has been ongoing. And I'm curious as to what your personal story is and connection to the topic. Uh, well, thank you. And it's a great, great honor to share the stage with you. Uh, and so my personal connection, well, I mean, I wrote this book because I, I was concerned about the future of American democracy. And, you know, in Washington, I, I see a dysfunctional and broken Congress. And it seemed to me that the core problem in American politics was hyperpartisanship. Uh, and so I, I started to think about, well, is, is how do we understand how we got into this moment and how do we understand how we got out of this moment. I feel like there were a lot of books coming out, you know, around around the time that Trump got elected saying, oh, you know, Trump is is this force out of nowhere who's destroying American politics. And uh, well, you know, the, the symptoms, I think I think there's there's deeper, uh, deeper structural causes to how we got to this moment. And, you know, I wanted to try to understand them and think about a way out of them. And, you know, I went down a, a few rabbit holes. I, I went down the the history rabbit hole of how, you know tracing tracing how we got to this point and then i went down to the went down the comparative politics rabbit hole which is like well what what is the rest of the world doing is there anything that we can learn and by the end of that i said well we have this hyper hyper partisan two party system that that is actually something quite new in our political history and this is really dangerous and the us is a really strange country and people should know a little bit more about how weird we are compared to the rest of the world uh, and, and maybe there's something else to learn. You, you talk about the, you know, where we are now. It's, we all want to blame Trump, but certainly Donald Trump's a, a symptom of yeah. something else historically in this country. If you look at what's happening in the United States Senate right now and the way the party politics are just split, even though we know there are a lot of formerly good people um, who have consciences, uh, for whatever reason, there's kind of a hyper-partisanship where people are split in these parties. And you talk a lot about that and have done a lot of research around how we got to this place of polarization. And I'd love it if you could share with folks, you know, where were we, say, 40 or 50 years ago in this country, what the parties look like, and how we got to a position that we're in now where everything's so bifurcated. Yeah. So, I mean, if you went back and you took a time machine, you went back to 1950, what you'd find was that the parties were pretty indistinguishable from each other. And a lot of the criticism of American politics back then, and you know, e even until somewhat recently, was not that the parties were too far apart. It was that the parties were too similar and they were indistinguishable. Uh, now, 
that that sunny consensus of the 1950s and the 1960s isn't actually so sunny because a lot of it was based on a, on a somewhat exclusionary brand of politics, which a bunch of southern white guys in a room got together and 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 made policy, uh, and and it, it depended on the extension of or the continuation of the Jim Crow South. So I mean, the the big earthquake in American politics was was civil rights in the 1960s, which uh, really split both parties and set in motion a long, slow realignment of the political parties uh, along social, cultural identity issues. Uh, and it, it, it went alongside with it with a nationalization of American politics that for a long time, American politics was really state and local politics. And as the issues became, uh, national issues became more salient, people started caring more and more which party controlled Congress. Uh, now that, that uh, you know, Built for a while, then I would say in the 90s you really started to see the the, the salience of, of true culture war politics, and the parties became much sharper brands, and they retreated to their geographical cores. The the Republican Party became more and more the party of rural, traditional, uh, white Christian America, and the Democratic Party became more and more the party of urban, cosmopolitan, multiracial, multi multicultural America, and. Uh, and a, as that happened, you know, you used to have a lot of liberal Republicans in New England and in New York and, and on the uh, and the coast, and you had a lot of conservative Democrats uh, from rural America and, and in the South. And you know, I, I argue that we had something much more like a four-party system, and it probably worked best from the mid '60s through the late '80s, in which you had the liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats alongside liberal Republicans. And uh, uh, sorry, long liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans, and you know, on any given issue, those the, you you could build different coalitions. And so, a lot of landmark legislation passed uh, in in the Senate and the House with large, overwhelming majorities. I mean, even the civil rights legislation uh, passed with overwhelming majorities, and actually, more re a higher percentage of Republicans supported the civil rights bills in '64 and, and '65 than did Democrats. Uh, so once you had the collapse of, of, of those parties and the parties became more bifurcated and with a winner-take-all system, uh, you, you, you know, if, you, if you're down to 40 percent, as, as Republicans were in the, in the Northeast and Democrats were in rural America, you basically stop bothering to run candidates and then the parties shrink further to their geographical cores. And now we're at this moment when we, I would argue, that we, for the first time, really have a genuine two-party system with two parties with no overlap, two truly distinct national parties. Uh, and and, and it, that's the radical experiment that we've been running for the last decade, and it's a disaster. It doesn't work with our politi political institutions, and it's driving us all crazy. <laughs> so you call this the doom loop, yes. is what you call this. So how worried should we be about American democracy right now? Because I'm flipping out. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, uh, anybody else flipping out? It's a hot mess. Yeah, all right, all right. So yeah, a lot, a lot of wisdom here. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we should be flipping out a little bit. Um, yeah, we, we are in this moment of intense hyperpartisanship. And there's no clear resolution to it. We, we, you know, a democracy depends on a shared basis of fairness, shared sense of legitimacy, shared sense of, of, of truth. And you know, there's going to be conflict in politics. Politics is about conflict. But we need a political system which recognizes that there is some way to resolve those differences and, and some process that we can all agree is fair. But we don't really have that anymore. And we have a, a situation where neither side really thinks the outcome is fair if they lose. And we have a situation in which the politics of changing the rules are becoming more and more aggressive. I mean, certainly think the Republicans have pushed this a lot further than the Democrats over the last two decades. But I mean, I could I hear talk about packing the court. The Democrats had Puerto Rico and D.C. as states. You know, I mean, we're in a moment in which we're, we're People who get into power want to use that power to further that power rather than creating a level playing field. And, and that is a, a dangerous condition because once you lose that shared sense of fairness, shared sense of legitimacy, and willingness to compromise, it's really hard to maintain a democracy. Well, back up for a minute because I, I want to be a little bit hopeful and I want you to yeah. wax poetic for us a bit uh -huh. about oh. what would be those incentives to get back to a place, and maybe were we ever even a place in America where there was incentive for compromise um, around some shared value of 
democracy. She started off, you know, acknowledging that maybe 1950s U.S. Congress wasn't necessarily a deep representation yeah. of our democracy. So what do you think might be a way to incentivize us back to a place where the folks who were elected to represent us felt like they were actually required to represent all of the United States and be a representative democracy. Well, I, I feel like what we need is a is we have representatives who actually do represent the full diversity and pluralism of America. Um, so, you know, I I, I think that I mean this is it's a it's a fundamental challenge, and, and it goes back to to Madison and federal Federalist Number Ten, and and Madison you know, I think which is a very brilliant essay and, and really the, the foundation, I think, of the American political system. And Madison says, look, here, here, here's the challenge of democracy, self-governance, is that there are a lot of factions in society and people are going to disagree. People are going to have different religious values. People are going to have different uh, financial and, and economic interests. And so we've got to set up a system that's legitimate for everyone. So the way we got to do that is make sure that there is no one faction that is permanently dominant, and no one faction that is permanently dominated. So no permanent majorities, no permanent minorities. And to build legitimacy, you actually have to build an inclusive coalition. And to me, that is a vision of how multi-party democracy operates in practice, that there's, it's not one side trying to be a narrow majority and, and oppress the other side. I mean, the, the framers aided political parties. They were desperately afraid of political parties because they thought that what political parties would be would, would be just two parties, and you would have a majority party and a minority party. And, and as it always had been, uh, a majority would use its power to oppress a minority, and the minority would say, this system's not legitimate, and therefore you'd have civil war or some sort of collapse of democracy. Now, the system th that they came up with to prevent political parties was separation of powers plus federalism, which... In, in, in a sense, sort of did the job that they thought it was going to do for a good 200 years, really preventing the, the strong national parties. But that that is the past now, and you know, I mean, obviously, it has a it has a checkered past as well. Uh, you know, but it, it 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 sort of worked. But you know, I, th I think, I, and I really do believe, had proportional representation been invented at the time, it wouldn't be invented until the, the early 19th century. It wouldn't go into use in, until the, the early 20th century. Uh, and have they accepted that political parties are necessary for modern mass democracy to function, they would have wanted something like that. So where does this work? Talk to us about what you mean by proportional representation and talk to us about models of um, a multi-party democracy so that everyone kind of understands where this might work. Yeah. So proportional representation is actually a family of electoral systems that are designed to guarantee that a party that gets 30 percent of the vote in the electorate gets 30 percent of the seats in the legislature. Uh, and what we have is first past the post, which is single winner districts in which it's theoretically possible for one party to get 46 percent of the vote and get zero percent of the seats but it doesn't win any any elections or for someone to win the or, majority of the vote for president and then not become president yeah or as as or through intense gerrymandering to win 46 percent of the seats and 40 percent of, of the vote and win like 60 percent of the seats as uh, in like wisconsin so it, it allows for all kinds of gerrymandering now th there are a broad range of of proportional representation systems um you know the, the most extreme Hyper PR version is Israel, which you know has a has one national electoral district and a, and a relatively low threshold for parties, and so Israel has seventeen parties uh, in government, and, and or seventeen parties that have representation in government, and that and that's too many. Uh, sorry, uh, can you imagine that here? Yeah, I mean it's too many. We, we <laughs> like more than seven gets too confusing, too much fracture. But like four to six is probably I think more or less the right yeah. amount. And the, the way you target that number is both by the threshold, how, many, how, how much share do you need to get representation, and the district size, the larger the district magnitude, the more parties. So the, the, the system that, that I propose in this book is ranked choice voting, uh, which we can go into a little bit more detail with multi-member districts. It's, it's a system that Ireland has used for 100, about 100 years, a system that Australia has used. Uh, you know, I think these are relatively healthy democracies uh, with, with you know, pretty, pretty stable, moderate, multi-party systems. 
Uh, you know, there are there are we could discuss different models, but I think th that's the one that that I'm that I mostly think is the best. So map that out for us then. So here yeah. we are in the in the United States, right? We've got a two party system. It's only getting worse at yeah. this point. Yeah. Um, and I personally think that it's going to get even worse before it gets better because right. you just said something that alarmed me. Um, not because you know you're wrong in thinking history, but because Donald Trump has said this in a lot of different ways that when these when the party system fractures and democracy breaks down, it often leads to civil war. Yeah. And that frightens me because it is a conversation that, you know, a couple of days ago we see, like, guys marching in the streets with guns to defend their rights in a very militia mentality. We see a lot of, like, frustration and uprising um, where people are, you know, lawmakers in, say, uh, last year in Oregon, Republican lawmakers kind of, like, fled and threatened and said, we're going to get our militias to protect us, federal government, if you come and do X, Y, and Z. And so there's these... Um, Around the country we're seeing right now, and it's broken down on party lines, this yeah. kind of subtle, not so subtle unrest starting to burgeon up. And it makes me really anxious. And so I wonder, as you are doing this um, theoretical work, right. if you could kind of bring it into like where we are today with this two-party system that's broken and kind of you know what you think could be the worst case scenario or the best case scenario about how we reel ourselves in. I mean, the worst case scenario is is that violence that's below the surface and increasingly peaking up becomes just more above the surface. I mean, you know, th there is, I think, a genuine risk of, of, of some serious political violence in this country. I think there's a genuine risk of elections being rigged and not fair. I think there's a genuine risk of a crackdown on, on civil liberties. All, all of these things, I think, are, are genuine risks. Now, uh, but ultimately, you know, I'm I'm hopeful because I think we're having this conversation, we're and we're asking these big questions. And we're, you know, a lot when you know when Donald Trump got elected, that was a that was a tremendous wake up call for a lot of people in this country who were not very politically engaged and got very politically engaged. And people have been turning out to political events, getting involved in politics at incredibly high level. A whole whole younger generation is is really engaged in politics. Uh, and, and that makes me optimistic. Um, also, I'm optimistic because we've had cycles of decline and renewal in, in the history of American politics. And there have been these eras in which it felt like things were broken uh, and nothing was going to happen. And then people got engaged. Social movements built up. Uh, there was a moral energy to politics. And we, and we have made our democracy throughout our history more inclusive more representative, more democratic, more responsive. And we've done it, you know, I would argue we've done it four times. The Revolutionary War, the expansion of the franchise in the 1830s, uh, the Progressive Era is the big one in which, you know, we, we got women's suffrage, um, we got a direct election of senators, primaries, referendum and initiative, and the, the Civil Rights Era is the other big one, and, you know, in which we got tremendous expansion of the franchise. Uh, so. Th these big bursts of democracy renewal happen every 60 years or so, and if I tack on another 60 years from the 1960s, that takes us to the 2020s. And we see a, a, a lot of the similar uh, similar hallmarks of these periods. We see a, a moral energy and energized uh, ener people, people being very energized about politics. Uh, also, in all these areas, there's been a transformation of, of the media structure in that new new media uh, entered and, and displaced old media and gave gave new voices and a rise of social movements. And I, I think of new social movements that are really, really empowered by the media, whether it's Black Lives Matter or the Me Too movement, which, you know, I mean, a lot of voices that had been shut out. And, and there are these transformations in which the, the hierarchy and the, uh, of society is changing. And, you know, th those, those cause, uh, you know, some people to feel like, Things are going going downhill because they're losing power. But in the end, you know, these are moments in which our democracy expands to be more more inclusive and more representative and more responsive. And I think we're. Yeah. I, I mean, I really do feel like, you know, or maybe know, this. Is, you know, I'm torn because on the one hand, you know, I, I see what's happening now, and it, it's easy to feel pessimistic, and hence hence the doom loop. But 
you know, it's these moments of crisis. I mean, we're, we're having these conversations, and a lot of people are having similar conversations. I think, though, that the need, you, you just talked about how the need for um, us to have this structural upheaval is actually more prevalent now, perhaps, than through yeah. those other four cycles yeah. you talked about. Because when you had what operated more like a, maybe we should close this door here, just close that what operated more like a four-party-ish kind of fluidy system as we were going through those those revolutionary changes, you actually had a, a, a setup in America where people could protest on the outside and there was some level of change. Yeah, so yeah. if the media structure, you know, opened up or, or whatever it was, you could go in there, the, the civil, Dr. King, could go in and he could shame enough segregationists through photos of people being, you know, blown out in the streets that something would change, right? Now what you're sharing with us is that we look at the Senate today and Mitch McConnell doesn't have to move. Yep. He doesn't have to do a damn thing. Yep. Literally, you have, whether we have protests in the streets, whether we have media, new media that is truth-telling, Literally right now, you have uh, um, you have the 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 members of the house who are actually serving as the lawyers putting up video of testimony that can't be refuted. This is literally out of the mouths of people who have testified, and you still have an entire party that's like fingers in their ear. Nope, we're not doing anything. No, 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 it's no. And so I I want to be hopeful too, but I wonder if we have as structurally gotten to a point where we're stuck in this doom loop of this two party kind of system, where then are there levers of change to actually move people who frankly don't feel that they have to be moved because they're going to get reelected in their districts, to your point, because they're not competitive anymore yeah. for all the reasons. Um, what do we do? Like, how do we see an opportunity to fix something? Well, I mean, I think most Americans are, are deeply frustrated with how the system works. Uh, I mean, you look at, at however you want to frame this as a polling question, you know, how people feel about how our democracy is working uh, ha is hitting lows in the history of modern polling, trust in government, uh, mm -hmm. satisfaction. So people – and nobody – although although people are partisan, uh, people don't – nobody feels like they're winning. Everybody feels like they're losing. Uh, and you know, more and more Americans are – choosing to identify as independent, neither Democrat nor Republican. Uh, now they may vote as Democrats or Republicans, but they're protesting the, the party system by refusing to identify. In polls, two-thirds of Americans say they would like to have more than two parties. That's at a, at a record high number. So uh, there's there's a lot of support out there, and, and I look at what's happened. I look at what happened in Maine, that the citizens in Maine uh, twice voted over the legislature using the, the, the referendum process to have ranked choice voting in Maine. There would probably be a ballot initiative in Massachusetts. So there are a lot of states where people can do ballot initiatives. Um, you know, also, New, New York has, ranked, has passed ranked choice voting for, for, um, for, for city elections. Uh, it's catching on. So, you know, and even politicians themselves, they don't like the job. Most members of Congress complain all the time how miserable it is to be a member of Congress because all they're doing is all this endless partisan fighting. Uh, I mean, a lot of people in the Republican Party feel that their party has been taken over by Trump. But the thing is, in a two-party system, they have nowhere else to go. So they got to embrace the guy, and their electoral fates are tied to him. I mean, remember, Trump was not particularly popular or beloved within the Republican Party when he started out. But a lot of Republicans realize, well, I'm not a Democrat, and you know, we well, he, that's this is my team, and you know, at least he's trolling the liberals. So okay, great, uh, and and that and and it's that you know, trolling the libs uh, is is. <laughs> It is a phrase of our time, but it's a phrase about negative partisanship. It doesn't matter what Trump is doing. He can do anything. As long as he's pissing off those liberals, he's okay. Uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. And you know that's what unifies the parties increasingly is, well, we're just going to unify. We don't care what our side does as long as our side beats the other side and makes them mad. So if two-thirds of the population is now currently polling, saying that they're not into any of this party badness and they want to completely disassociate with it. Do we see an opportunity? Do you see an opportunity to go in to that two-thirds and say, guys, I've got a new system for you? And do you think that we could actually create a movement around, like, kind of 
Eh. Ranked choice voting. Talk to us about that and what that might look like. Because right now we're literally doing it at the ballot, and that's its own yeah. thing that happens in liberal bastions, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Well, I, I mean, I, I do think that, that there is support and demand, and there's already a movement that's beginning to build around electoral reform. Now, ranked choice voting, for those of you um, who are not familiar with it, it's a, a system of voting where rather than having a single shot, uh, pick only one, you get to rank your candidates in order of preference, and you'll now get to do that if you vote in New York City primaries. Um, now, there are two, there's the single winner form of ranked choice voting, which is what's mostly been used, and then there's the multi-winner form. I'll, I'll explain the single winner form uh, first. Single winner form, form is, you know, there are candidates on the ballot, you rank them one to five uh, in order of your preference, then the, the votes are tallied. If one candidate has, the, has a majority of first preference votes, that candidate is the winner. If not, we go to a second round, and it's, it, it's a runoff. The bottom candidate is tossed out. Uh, their uh, votes are transferred to whatever whoever their voters listed as their backup choice, their second preference, and then we keep aggregating up until you get a majority winner. Uh, now, the, the the case for ranked choice voting is, I think, quite strong. Uh, I mean, one, it allows people fuller expression of of how they how they want to rank their candidates, and allows people to vote for a candidate that they really like, even if that candidate might they might otherwise be a spoiler. So it removes the spoiler effect forces candidates to build broader coalitions uh, and to actually be to, to build a, a majority coalition in the single winner system and it, it, it where it's been implemented it's voters really like it uh, it gives them more expression more choices and it leads to less negative campaigning and more coalitional politics because even if even if I'm not going to be your first choice I might want to be your second or third choice and it leads candidates to reach out to other constituencies that they might have written off if it wasn't going to be their first if, if they weren't going to be their first choice uh, now the multi-winner form which which would be rather than having a single member district you'd say have a five member district which they do in Ireland uh, and for the Australian Senate is it works the voter experience is the same you get to rank your candidates but rather than just having the one winner get a majority uh, you have the top five finishers after transfers. And that's a proportional form because it's a multi-winner election, so you don't have to get 50% uh, in order to get representation. And in Ireland, they typically have between three and five parties. So in all honesty, how many people got that? Who's confused? So this is actually quite interesting. And I asked this yeah. question not because, I mean, it's a... It's, it sounds to me like a very democratically fair idea, and I personally support ranked choice voting, but I'll tell you something. I live in Bed-Stuy, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, which is an African-American community, and New York just had on the ballot in November ranked choice voting. Yeah. And so I was down at my local Democratic club meeting and having this conversation, and I show up. It's not a surprise that I'm a more of, of a progressive on these issues, and I think about democracy, and I was shocked to find that my local Democratic club actually was um, passing out palm cards telling people in our community not to vote for it. And they were telling people to not vote for it because the seniors at the senior center, so like, you know, black folks over like 50, were completely confused about the whole thing. Had no idea what, like didn't understand, I gotta rank people, I normally just get to pick one. I'm a Democrat, like do I vote for the Democrats? What's the, you know, how do I vote on party lines? It was actually quite, Confusing, and so I wonder: Is there an education? Given two thirds of the people think that what we have is not good, yeah. But so many other people, especially reliable voters who tend to be people over fifty, get really confused by it. How do we get over that and kind of bridge that education piece of it? Well, there certainly is an education component to it, and I, I mean, I think part of part of the effort has to in in reform is is about educating voters. I think the, the experience of the cities that have enacted it is that once people actually go through the process of doing it, they find that they like it, they find that it, it actually is simple, but it is something new. And uh, for, for a certain set of voters, that something new is something different and something scary. But you know, the, the overwhelmingly 90, 92, 95% of voters in cities that have it say it, was, it actually was simple and they like doing it. Can you give uh, us a scenario of how this might have played out in a recent hotly contested election if there were more of a ranked choice system rather than a winner take all who might not have actually been the winner? 
Are, are you thinking of, of the 2016 presidential election? Sure. Okay. All right. All right. So, all right. So, well, I mean, for, 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 we'll assume that there was no, I mean, the challenge, well, actually the challenge with that is that there, there is, we should think about it in a particular state because we have the yeah. electoral college. So like take Michigan, which Trump narrowly won, but he didn't get a majority of votes in Michigan. There were some Jill Stein voters. There were some Gary Johnson voters. Now, if you think that most of those voters, had they been forced to say, well, I, you know, I'm, I can only choose Clinton or Trump, they might have they probably would have chosen a lot of them probably would have chosen Clinton. Uh, and if they were allowed to rank, well, my, you know, my first choice is Jill Stein, but my second choice is Hillary Clinton. Then those Jill Stein, once Jill Stein got eliminated, those voters would have transferred to Hillary Clinton. Probably Johnson would have been more half and half, but uh, probably Hillary Clinton would have won under that circumstance. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <coughs> so when you talk about, um, so walk us through kind of the broad, so do are you lobbying for, are you recommending that every state shift to proportional representation up and down? In the way that we the way that we manage our political system is that how we fix this crazy two party doom loop? Oh. Yes. Uh. So then it's yeah. not about multi parties at all. It's about a ranked choice voting system, well, which a, is a different. <coughs> <coughs> well, a ranked choice voting system with proportional representation would effectively create a multi party system. So I mean, there are benefits. There are benefits of of ranked choice voting as a voting system. Independent. I, I mean, I think it would make two-party politics. If we kept the single winner system, it would make two-party politics work a little bit better. But I think the real power comes when you combine it with multi-member districts, which gives you a form of proportional representation, which allows for multiple parties. And now, what you have instead of having at a national level having two parties trying to compete for this narrow, elusive majority in which they they win by tearing down the other party, making the other party look extreme, incompetent, dangerous, suddenly you have five or six parties. Now, no party is a majority. No party thinks it's going to be the dominant party. Every party, in order to govern, has to work with other parties, has to build coalitions, has to, to, to build broader majorities, and has to be more inclusive. And so you, you have much a situation in which majorities are more fluid, and no, no one party feels like it's going to be permanently, you know, I mean, the, the danger in this current situation is that both sides feel like if the other side wins, my humanity is going to be compromised. Mm -hmm. my, my values are going to be fundamentally compromised because the other side is so extreme and so different. Uh, and th that is a, is a really dangerous position to be in. In a, in a multi-party system, you have m m you know, more, more different shades uh, uh, people who could see themselves in maybe one or two different parties, uh, and the parties are not trying to dominate each other in the same way. It's not this winner-take-all, zero-sum trench warfare for this limited control. It's, it's building broad coalitions to actually get stuff done. I'm curious how other people have, if you can share examples of how other countries may have shifted their system somewhere midway in like the last 100 years. Because I'm curious... It's one thing to have a brand new, let's say you have a brand new constitution, you're starting over, I don't know, South Africa or somewhere, right? Like a newer constitutional setup that can just mandate that we're going to have this and that's what we're going to do. Yeah. But when you're already entrenched in 400 years of history and then you try to figure out how to have some kind of structural change, it's far more difficult. And I, and I think the thing that's coming up for me as I listen to you talk about this, you just mentioned the word humanity as if... Politicians are supposed to be thinking about, you know, common humanity, right? And I feel like we've gotten a bit lost and away from the P, the, the actual people in our political yeah. system, the P in politics. There's a whole values underpinning about what you're talking about that gets down to dignity, respect, inclusivity, yeah. humanity, the actual people in the politics. Not at all what we talk about because it's so cutthroat. So yeah. how has this looked where have you seen other other societies get back to the heart of the heart and the people in order to be able to shift? Well, uh, one country that made the transition from a first-past-the-post two-party system to a, a proportional system uh, is New Zealand, which did it in the 1990s. Now, New Zealand politics was pretty dysfunctional throughout most of the 1980s. 
uh, and confidence in political institutions was extremely low. Uh, uh, there had been a very unpopular austerity program. Neither party and was was particularly popular, and there was uh, there was growing demand to, for New Zealand to change its political system to get rid of first past the post voting. Uh, and it was a little bit of a political football between the two parties. I, I tell the story of how that happened in the book. Uh, I have to buy it. Yeah, or or or, uh, or just look at chapter ten, uh, <laughs> browse it. Uh, but but yes, of course, buy it. Uh, and you know, it, it was this issue in which the you know the parties didn't you know initially opposed it, but then kind of once reform became so popular, parties eventually had to get behind it. And you know, New Zealand politics, which had been pretty dysfunctional up to that point, trusted institutions in New Zealand was in the single single digits. Uh, they adopted the they they adopted the actually the German system of proportional representation, which is a in which you get a compensatory vote, a party list vote on top of a single single member district. And th then New Zealand politics actually became a lot more functional after that. And and anybody who studies New Zealand politics considers that a very successful reform. And, you know, today New Zealand is constantly at the top of lists of, of healthiest democracies in the world. Mm. Huh. So more like <laughs> New Zealand. I, I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. I think that there's just so many factions here in the United States that it's kind of hard to break through. Can you talk to us about how um, diversity layers on top of this, the, the, the fact that we have a shifting demographic here yeah. where there's a rise of a whole new American majority that are um, people of color who are ultimately going to be the majority of the population and then at some point the majority of the voting age population, which is really throwing quite a wrench in so much of the divisiveness that we see, which is why you've got these hawkish immigration, I guess we call them immigration policies, they're just mean at this point. Um, so talk to us about like how all the social anxiety and what we're experiencing really factors into this. Because when you're a monolithic society, you can kind of do some interesting things. Yeah. Here, a little tricky. Well, having a multi-ethnic democracy is a challenge. Uh, and certainly the changing demographics, the changing power status hierarchies, uh, you know, have really created a, a tense political moment. Uh, but th that tension has been exacerbated and amplified by a party system which is fundamentally divided along these lines and that you have one party that is essentially the at, at its core a party of white traditionalist Christian America that says hold on this change is changing the America we know and we don't like it and another party the Democratic Party that says we believe we are a nation of immigrants diversity gives us strength and we we can't get there fast enough and uh, by making that conflict a very binary conflict when there are actually a lot more shades of gray in there uh, it, and making it about all these cumulative identities and people's entire and a sense that if if my side loses I have no say in the, I have no value I have no say in this country uh, we've just pure uh, we've just poured fire on on this on or pour, poured gasoline on this this little fire and ra and and you know it's made it very hard to control now a lot of societies are 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 divided along these these cleavage lines now and the most dangerous thing to do when you have that is to say okay we're going to put all the people who believe in diversity on this side and all the people who think that we're moving too fast on this side and now go fight it out for narrow for a narrow majority control and by the way if you lose the other side will crush your humanity and you know that that's just a recipe for uh, for really dangerous politics. Now, I mean, I I, I think a lot well, of well, that about sums it up. Where we are today? Yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> fix it, Lee. All right. Well, <laughs> let, let, let's let's go, let's go back to Madison, Federalist Number Ten. Um, you know, and again, there, there's a basic point that Madison made in that you know essay. He says, you know, look, society is diverse. And the key is to, we, we want to create a, a politics in which no one side feels that they are going to be permanently dominant or permanently dominated. 
Now, Madison's first great cause was religious liberty, and he was really fond of a saying from Voltaire that, uh, you know, basically, I'll paraphrase because the, the, it's a little stilted, but uh, you know, that if, if there's one religion, it's arbitrary. If there's two religions, people are fighting over, uh, fighting over who, who gets to go to heaven and cutting each other's throat over it. And if there's many religions, people can live in peace. I mean, we have a we have a functioning multi ethnic democracy in 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 America. It's called New York City, <laughs> and you know New York City is yeah. it, is a place where there is no one group that is dominant. And because there's no one group uh, that there's no clear dominant group, everybody nobody is worried about being dominated by somebody else. And you know, I mean, not that New York City doesn't have its tensions and its problems, but you know, I think on the whole, it's a pretty healthy multi ethnic democracy. Mm -hmm. So that that gives me hope. Mm. Hmm. So I want to know, I know that you all have some, ex some interesting questions that you want to raise. Um, so I want to leave time for that. But just as we're on this, this converse, this kind of thread through about humanity, I am very much interested how you consume this history. You consume this broken system. You have hope for how we fix it, but see the frustrations in front of us of how challenging that is. And you've been embedded in this for so many for so long, just your career, but certainly, you know, not really seeing the light of day over the last few years. Tell us a little bit about your humanity. What do you do for fun? What do I do for fun? What do you do for fun? Um, I, 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 I cook dinner for my family. I play with my kids. I play music. Uh, and dedication in your book? And dedication to my book. I have two young daughters, Elsa and, and Hava. Elsa is, is six. Hava is three and a half. And, and I dedicated this book to them because I want them to grow up in a healthy, thriving democracy. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, thank, thank you. you so much for your work. And I hope that, you know, you get out on the circuit and kind of influence uh, people who still have a, a heart left and actually who just care deeply about our society and our democracy. I think we've gotten a bit away from that, um, where the people who care don't even feel like they can talk about it because yeah. they're in such a, a fight.